Have you ever watched uh, a maybe a, a cartoon or or a TV commercial, or have been driving down the road listening to the radio, and a voice comes on the radio, and and you think to yourself, "Hey, I, I, I know that voice. Who's, whose voice is that? I know that voice, right? Did that ever happen to you guys? Yeah, okay." Some voices uh, that we hear on the radio or in commercials are uh, they're unmistakable, right? You hear their voices and you just know exactly who it is that's, that's talking. Uh, and that's why promotion companies and these advertising agencies, they do their very best to get people with highly recognizable voices uh, to do their ads for them. So the question is, how good are you at picking out voices from commercials. I have, oh, you're pretty good, Briley? Okay, that's good. I have a couple here for us to, uh, to listen to. Let's see if we can figure out who this first voice is. After 40 years of making chicken soup at Progresso, we've learned a thing or two. Okay, actually just one thing. Chicken is king. That's the Progresso soup commercial. Anybody know who it is? Jonathan Lithgow is the guest. Brittany, are they correct? It is Jonathan Lithgow. Very good. Very good. Jonathan has a pretty, uh, a pretty unique voice. All right. Number two. This one may be a little difficult. I don't know. Sweet. Uh, I see you are overcome with love. Or could it be congestion and other seasonal nasal allergy symptoms? Anybody other than Cameron? Only Nasonex is clinically proven to both treat and... It is, in fact, symptoms, including congestion. Antonio Banderas. Yes. Yes. Very good. You're like, Antonio Medeiros was the B in the Nasonex commercial. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. This one may stump some of you, but we'll try it anyway. Go ahead and turn it up a little bit, too. In the nation, sometimes bad things happen. But add brand new belongings from Nationwide Insurance, and we won't just give you the partial value of items that are stolen or destroyed. Any guesses? Who? Just another way we put members first because we don't have shareholders. That's right. Join the nation. Nationwide is on your side. It's on the tip of Crystal's tongue. She just. Nope. Julia. Julia Roberts. It is, in fact, Julia Roberts. Yes. That was a little more difficult. That commercial aired for like a year before I ever, it ever dawned on me that that was Julia Roberts. All right, last one. Everybody needs to get this one, right? Last one. A collection of treasures lies between these bumpers. Is it Sam Elliott, Brittany? <laughs> Industry gold. It is Sam Elliott. Yes, yeah, Sam has one of the most recognizable voices of all times. When we hear these voices... Go ahead and keep Sam's picture up there because it'll probably make me sound better just seeing... No, I'm just going to take it down there. Um, thanks, thanks. When we see these commercials or we hear these advertisements laid out on the radio, the idea is that we form this immediate bond with the voice that's telling us something and the product that's being advertised. And some of you guys are like, what? No way. No, research studies have proven this, that when it's a, a well-known, very recognizable individual that promotes your products, you get people's attention. And, and, and the point of this, this advertising scheme is, is that they, when they, they speak and we hear them is that we can relate to them and, 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 and we draw back these, these memories of these feelings of whatever it is that we've seen them in, these movies, these shows, and we think, okay, on a subconscious level, I, I, I kind of know who this is and I... I kind of connect with this person, right? There's a new insurance commercial that just started airing this week with one of my favorite actors, Dennis Quaid, right? And, and in the actual ad, he says, insurance asked me to be their spokesman because, and he opens his jacket and pulls out this paper, he goes, apparently I'm highly likable, right? And it's a really funny commercial. I almost dropped our insurance, Christina, and went with insurance just because it was Dennis Quaid, but... Um, there is truth to correlating recognition, comfort, 
connection with the voices that we hear. You know, they tell uh, moms to be, to talk to the baby so that the baby learns to recognize the voice. This is something, this concept is something that's taken straight out of the Bible itself. Hang, hang with me and I'll, I'll explain what I mean. Today, we're going to start a series uh, that I'm pretty excited about. And uh, you read your bulletins, it's on the screen. It's, it's, it's entitled, The Voice of God. And over my many years of, of ministry, both uh, as a youth pastor and now as a senior pastor, I can't tell you how many times I've been asked the question, how do you hear the voice of God? And more importantly, people come into the office and they say, how, how can I hear the voice of God? And if you've ever sought the answer to this question, if you've been one of those individuals at some point, and I think we all have at some point in our life, my hope is that over the next series of weeks is that we will get the answers to that question. Because hearing, recognizing, knowing the voice of God is an integral part of our walk with Him. So with that being said, I would ask that you would turn with me to the book of John. And we're going to be in chapter 10 this morning in the book of John. As you read through this book, you, you, you come to this understanding that there is much that is revealed about who Jesus is and about what his mission was on this earth. As you work your way through and you get to chapters 8 and 9, you, you, you come to this point where the Pharisees, they've heard Jesus teach and they've heard him preach and they've heard him say some things and they're still questioning, they're struggling with some of the things that he's, that he's telling. There's, there's, there's much speculation on their parts. We also see in, in these two chapters, 8 and 9, that Jesus heals a man of his blindness. More importantly than that, it was a man who had been born blind. So this was a big deal. And this definitely gets the attention of, of the religious leaders of the day and, and, and the Pharisees. And so when we get, we get to chapter 10, we receive probably, in, in my opinion, one of the greatest pieces of imagery laid out by Jesus Christ during his teaching. When he talks about this concept of the good shepherd. It was definitely something for the people of Jesus' day, they understood. They could relate to this concept. And even though, you know, we can't walk outside our front doors here in Neosho and, 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 and find some sheep and a sheep farmer and a shepherd, we, we, we just can't do that. If you go to Israel, you'll still very much see that. Even though we can't do that, we can relate to the story. We can relate to the teaching. We can understand what it is that Jesus is saying. And, and as he works through this story of the good shepherd, he basically comes out and, and, and reveals who he is. There's a number of teachings that take place, and he reveals that the good shepherd is someone who never runs from his flock when danger arrives. The good shepherd is someone who lays down his life for his sheep. The good shepherd is someone who knows his sheep, and they know him. How do they know him? By his voice. After this long teaching, after this long explanation of what the good shepherd is, Jesus is approached by some of these Pharisees. And just as they always do, they want more. We want to hear more. We want you to say something that we can catch you in to get you arrested. We want, we want to hear things from you. So stand with me this morning, and we're going to see exactly what it is that they said to him and exactly what the reply was. As we read in the book of John, chapter 10, verses 22 and following. It says this, At that time, 
The Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. And so the Jews, they gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep, they hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for the free gift of grace that you shower upon us every day. God, when we fail you, Lord, when we fall short. God, when we come to you, Lord, your arms are open wide. God, today as we start this series on being able to hear your voice, Lord, to listen to you, God, I pray first of all that you would open our ears, Lord, that you would open our hearts, God, to an understanding and a realization of who you are and how you communicate with us. God, our ability to communicate with you is so very important to who we are as your children. God, would you lead us and guide us today as we study your word? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. People everywhere yearn to hear God's voice. They do. Is God speaking to us? Is it possible to hear his voice? Does God want us to hear his voice? How does God speak? How are we supposed to listen? So much about us hearing God's voice and about how we are the sheep and we are to hear the shepherd's voice, so much about this bears witness to how we are to know who Jesus is and who God the Father is. You know, I said earlier, and, and, and I was trying to figure it up, it's, it's been probably 20 years of, of ministry, volunteer, part-time, full-time. Uh, this is probably the number one question I get. The number one question when people say, hey, can I come visit you in your office? You know, can I come talk with you about something? I, I need some help with something. It usually comes down to how do I hear God's voice and know that he's speaking to me? Jesus makes it clear. As, as you read through this story of the good shepherd and then you get into to verse 22 when we were talking about the Pharisees and, and their question to him, he makes it very clear that it's his voice that gives us instruction for God's will in our life. There's, there's a very clear connection. It's almost as if much of our assurance of eternal life in this relationship with Jesus Christ, much of it rests on our ability to hear the Good Shepherd. If this is the case, why is it that so many of us, I threw myself in there, why is it that so many of us struggle at times, hearing God's voice. As I said a few minutes ago, that's the answer. That's the answer that we're seeking over this next series of weeks. Because here's the reality. God is speaking to us. We can hear His voice. We should hear his voice. 
Christianity is a relationship, and every relationship is established and maintained through communication. As we learn to hear God's voice, as we learn to grow closer to God, our relationship with Him should deepen. We should come to the point where we recognize our Heavenly Father. With that being said, um, in this opening message this morning, we're going to we're going to ease into this topic, right? We're not just going to jump in full speed because there's there's a lot to cover. And unfortunately, the answer to this question, how do I hear and, and, and know God's voice, unfortunately, that isn't just something that I can give you a, a, a one-sentence answer to and say, here you go. There, there's a lot to it, and there's a lot of aspects to it, which is why it's going to take us a while to work through. But, but I, want to, I want to step in. It's like, it's like jumping into a pool, right? You, you want to step in nice and slow and kind of get acclimated to what we're doing. So that's what we're going to do, right? Some of you are like, I just like to cannonball. Okay, well... I'll give you my notes and you can start studying. But um, we're going to ease today. And, and, and the way that we're going to do that is we're going to talk, first of all, before, before we really get into this idea of, of discerning and singling out God's voice and, and knowing and hearing and understanding Him, we've got to come to the point where we realize that there are actually three very different voices in your head and in your heart at any given time. So for those of you who thought you were crazy and you're like, I hear voices in my head, you're good as long as there's just three. If there's any more than three, then, then we may need to talk at some point. Um, but there are three voices that you're going to hear. I do want to make sure that I clarify this. At this point, the voices that we're talking about are not audible voices that you're going to pick up through your ears. These are internal voices. Come from your heart, come from your mind. Okay, so these, these are internal. First voice is this. Your own. That's good, right? That's good? That's good that your own voice is in your head? That's, that's good. You've heard from your pastor from the pulpit that uh, you have a voice in your head and it's okay. This is, of course our internal voice. It's the voice that, 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 that we know that says who we are. You can ask yourself questions. Should I get out of bed this morning? That's usually a tough one, right? Should I hit the snooze just one more time? How many of you guys didn't have power this morning? Yeah, it was, it was easy to not roll over and get out of bed, right? It's just dark. It's, yeah. Should I go to work today? It's a question. Should I go to school today? Hopefully, hopefully that's a question maybe your parents can help audibly give you the answer to, right? Should I spend my money on food? Should I spend it on clothing? Should I buy some toys? Should I listen to this music? Should I listen to that music? Hopefully the idea is that you get a response back from your internal voice, right? Your voice kind of talks to itself, and hopefully you get this response back as, as a thought or, or, or maybe a, a precise uh, guiding tone or something. Somehow the hope is that you get some sort of an answer, some advice to follow, right? Yeah, I probably should get out of bed. I'm supposed to preach in the next couple of hours. It would be bad if I didn't show up. That's the internal voice saying, get up, go, right? We hear our own voices almost every second of every day. It's loud. It's us. It's, it's, it, it's our thoughts. It's, it, it's who we are. We know it. We trust it. We hope, and I said the word hope, that it gives us good advice and leads us down good paths. However, what we have to keep in mind is that our own voice, the very voice that we know the best, comes from a body and a soul that bears a very bad nature, a sinful nature. 
Even born-again believers in Christ will still struggle and still have this capacity for the sinful nature to, to reveal itself again. And, and, and the Bible says that it's a constant battle between us and the sinful nature. It's this constant battle. And this is why this is a problem. This is where, this is where our own voice can really hurt us. Because the first voice that we hear, this number one voice, this is the voice that gets mistaken for God's voice the most often. We hear ourselves telling ourselves to do something and we think, oh, well, that was God. We're going to discuss later on how God's still small voice is just a whisper. Our own voice is not. Our own voice is it's pretty loud. Moving right along, voice number two, the second voice that you're going to hear inside your head is none other than the enemy's voice. You will hear the enemy's voice in your head and in your heart. It's always around. He's always there. Trying to speak lies to your heart trying to convince you that what you need to do is contrary to what your Heavenly Father is calling you to do. If you're not a born-again believer in Christ, if you've never given your life to the Lord, then Satan's number one job description for you is to keep you as far from hearing the call of the Lord and to keep you as far from doing the things that God wants you to do to hear that call as he possibly can. If they're not a Christian, Satan's goal is to keep them being not a Christian. That's his goal. Ironically enough, he achieves this goal the very same way he works to achieve his goal against believers in Christ. If you have accepted the Lord, you have repented of your sins, you have received the gift of forgiveness and the gift of grace, Satan still wants to speak lies and non-truths into your heart and into your mind in order to keep you as far away from your heavenly Father as he possibly can. Anything that he can do to destroy that relationship, anything that he can do to keep you uneasy, uncertain, questioning, He does this in a very simple way. He's loud. He gets our attention. He's very prominent when he wants us to do something. If the enemy can drown out our own voice, takes you one step closer to overpowering the other voice. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. Jesus knew then. Jesus knows now. That's why he made it such a big point. He understands that this is going to be an ongoing battle for mankind. He understood that. For those that he was talking to that day, chapter 10 in the book of John, he says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved They will come in and go out and find pasture. And some of you know the rest of what I'm about to say. But the thief, the thief comes only to what? To steal, kill, and destroy. Make no mistake about it. Don't don't trick yourself into believing something that's not true. The enemy, Satan, he is not here to lead us into having an enjoyable, good time. Satan is here for one purpose and one purpose only, to seek you out to kill and destroy everything about you. He hates the fact that if you are a believer of God, he hates the fact that you are a child of God's. And if he can keep you from having a strong relationship with him, then he's going to do whatever he can to make that happen. He will be as loud 
as he can possibly be when he speaks. If he can keep you uninvested with your heavenly Father, then he, he's winning. At some point in this series, and, and, and I don't know exactly when, but at some point in this series, we're going to dissect the enemy's voice. We're going to break it down. We're, 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 going, to, we're going to look at, at, at how you can recognize it, how you can address it. Um, but for now, for this morning's sermon, for, so, so that we can walk away here with at least just a little bit about the enemy's voice, this is what I want you to leave here knowing. One way that you can recognize when the enemy is speaking to you is if it causes confusion. If the voice you're hearing is confusing things in and around you, we know from 1 Corinthians 14 that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. The enemy's voice will give you confusion, but God's voice will give you peace. Which brings us to our final of the three voices this morning. God's voice. We have our own voice, we have the enemy's voice, and we have God's voice. Many of you will remember this story about Elijah in the book of 1 Kings, it's chapter 19. Starting with verse 11, it says this, and he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke it in pieces, the rock before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. When we read about Elijah hearing the voice of God, we, we, we see and we understand that it wasn't in the strong wind, it wasn't in the earthquake, it wasn't in this roaring fire. It was in a still, small, low whisper. God uses this whisper of the Holy Spirit to speak to the hearts of his children. John 10, 27 says, my sheep, they hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. The voice of God is a voice that speaks of truth, love, and life. It's this voice that leads you out of the things of unrighteousness and drives you towards the things of righteousness. The voice of God is a voice that brings you fullness when you're empty. It brings you comfort when you're hurting. It brings you strength when you're weak. The voice of God is also the voice that convicts you when you've done wrong and leads you to a place of repentance and humbleness before His throne. So if you're a born-again believer in Christ, given what we've read, given what we've been told by Jesus, Hearing God's voice, recognizing God's voice, understanding God's voice should be something that we are all experts at doing. But there's a problem. It's a big problem. It's a problem that we've been talking about on Wednesday nights as we've worked through the book of, uh, of 1 John. Would you pull the slide up there that's next? That's our problem. Josh talked about sin last week, the effects of sin. 
It seeps its way into our hearts, into our minds, and leads us to behave in ways that are contrary to our new identity in Christ. How's this happen? It's pretty simple. Sin amplifies the enemy's voice, makes him louder, makes him be a whole lot louder than he normally is. Sin then encourages our old sinful nature to speak up a little louder, our own voice, right? Hey, that sounds like a good idea. I think I should do that. Satan uses our own voice against us. If left unchecked, those two voices can overpower that subtle, low, still, small whisper of God. We find ourselves going, I can't hear God. Is God speaking to me? I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't hear Him. Not always, and I, I throw that out there, not always, but most of the time, okay? Most of the time, the failure to hear God speak is often a dilemma that we have made ourselves. How do we correct that dilemma? You have to keep coming back for the rest of the series, right? I'm not going to leave you just with that. That is part of it. We're, we're going to work through a lot of different things, but in closing this morning, I'm going to ask that Joshua come up and get ready for invitation, but, but I do want to encourage you. I do want to encourage you with this. If you have found yourself in a place right now where you're like, I, I, can't, I can't hear God. I can't, I can't grab his voice. I, I can't sense what it is that he's saying to me. Then can I encourage you the exact same way that I encourage all the people who have ever come into my office and said those words to me? The very first thing that I say to them is this. Check the sin in your life. Are you doing something you're not supposed to be doing? Are you living in a sin that you know you're not supposed to be committing, yet you're doing it anyway, and then you're going, well, I can't hear God. The sin amplifies the enemy's voice, makes it louder, makes it stronger, makes it more powerful. It's hard to turn it down. How do you shut that out? You come before the throne of God. And you say, God, reveal to me the sin that's in my heart. Reveal to me the sin that I have been committing that has kept me from my relationship with you. God, reveal that to me that I can repent of it. God, that I can hear your voice. That's the first step. It's the first step in any, in any problem, really. It's realizing that there is one. I want to encourage you this morning as, as, as we have our time of invitation, I would ask that you would stand, but I would also ask that you would seek your own heart. Maybe the three voices in your, in your head need to have a conversation right now. And maybe you should listen to the quiet one. If you need to come forward, if you need to spend some time at the altar, it's here. If there's something else in your life that that you need to pray about, if there's something that you need to take to the Lord that, that may not have to do with what we've talked about, it may not be sin related at all, it just may be something that you want to go to the Lord, the altar is open. If you'd like someone to pray with you, I'll, I'll be up here. Whatever the case may be, take this time to focus on that, that small 
low whisper of a voice. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. God, I thank you for the power of your word, Lord, for the challenge of your word. God, I thank you that you do speak to us, Lord. God, we so often fail to listen. God, may we take that opportunity now, Lord, to shut everything else out, to turn everything else off, Lord, and just listen to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name.